uh, so let me try that one more time. Uh, what birds, bugs, butterflies, concrete, and asphalt all have in common? And the answer is roadside habitat. And here at the Department of Transportation, as one of our eight strategic goals is uh, environmental stewardship. And so as part of our normal construction projects, so every time that we do road maintenance or building a, a bridge or doing any type of construction project here in the state of Nebraska, it goes through a very thorough environmental review process. And so here you can see uh, what John and I are doing. We are threatened and endangered species specialists. I've been here in, at the Department of Transportation for a little over a year and in my current position for about six months. And so we do a number of different things. Here we can see uh, John is conducting a Migratory Bird Treaty Act survey. So we're surveying these nests before they're gonna be working on this uh, bridge up here. Uh, in this picture over here, uh, we are doing blowout pinstamen surveys and just kind of taking a look at the, the landscape for an upcoming project. Uh, additionally, we're subject to other laws other than the federal laws of uh, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we are also compliant with NESCA. Here, John is completing a river otter survey on the Loop River. That was that day? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> on the Loop River because uh, of a, a bridge project that was going to be completed. Uh, one of my favorite parts of our jobs is um, just being able to interface and network with uh, uh, other federal agencies, so federal agencies such as here we have the National Park Service and this uh, picture up here on a project we had to consult with the National Parks, Park Service, um, Nebraska Game and Parks, um, in addition to consultants and others within the Department of Transportation. So whenever we do a project, you know, we take a very broad view of it and, and, and see how it's going to be in, uh, affecting the environment and specifically John and I John, who's been here for two years yeah. now? You want to talk a little bit about yourself? Um, just roll. That's okay. Uh, 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 we focus on threatened and endangered species. So today we're going to be focusing a little bit at, uh, like on our broader program, which is uh, pollinators. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, there are approximately 121,000 acres of roadside uh, here in the state of Nebraska. And this is just on our state managed highways. So. As a, the State Department of Transportation, we are in charge of all of these highways. So the state highways, not the, the county roads or some of those gravel roads. And so just on those state highways and interstates, we have 121,000 acres of roadside. And that's outside of the pavement. So I'm not talking about you know, the, the asphalt, or the medians, or the safety strips. So the safety strips, which are about that five to 10 feet that we, that we regularly mow so that if something were to happen and you need to pull over, you have a safe place to, to go ahead and do that. So 121,000 acres of roadside across the state. And I know that since this is the Natural Legacy Conference, we have highways in every single BUL. And so we're looking to uh, you know, really highlight those areas. And especially in some areas of the state, since the uh, state of Nebraska is so highly egg dominated, in some areas, those roadsides are the only uh, habitat available to wildlife. So as I mentioned, so we're much more than just concrete, concrete bridges and asphalt. Um, we have a robust environmental program and our pollinator program kind of consists of the following areas. So roadside restorations and habitat set-asides, uh, our mowing, uh, rules and regulations, herbicide use, invasive species control, uh, research, and then public outreach. And so we're going to go into each of those pillars here in just a minute. So probably our, our largest contribution that we have here in terms of for pollinators are our, is our type A seeding. And so that is a high diversity wildflower mix. And uh, as we can see here, so this is Highway 75 just south of Nebraska City. I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of the really great uh, type A seedings that we've had on this highway. And so here within that first five to 10 feet is where that safety area is. And that really should be the only place that is being mowed on that highway. That's the only place where the Department of Transportation mows on that highway. And so that, that's being uh, mowed regularly, you know, so that everyone has a safe place to um, pull off for emergencies. And then here where we have all these wonderful wildflowers is what we refer to as the backslope. And so that's a great place where we can have 
space for some, some great pollinator species uh, here uh, on our roadside. And so uh, on average, we plant about 500 acres of that just as part of our normal uh, projects that we have here for the Department of Transportation. And over the last five years, we have planted uh, over 3,100 acres of that on a number of different projects. Now mowing and haying, you can check out some of our mowing and haying regulations from the Nebraska Department of Transportation Roadside Vegetation and Establishment uh, Manual. Uh, on most of our roads, the Department of Transportation does a mow out every two years and like that really helps us to uh, control like woody corrosion, which can cause problems for for safety and then we have that safety strip mowing so you can see here it's only like that five to ten feet and then we have this whole kind of back area that extends the entire way of the right of way. Now we do have uh, some has some issues when it comes to like volunteer or sometimes what we like to refer to as recreational mowing and you know just some some you know uh, adjacent landowners you know thinking that um, that the roadside needs to be mowed all the way up to the corn you know? and so uh, it's not the Department of Transportation that's going ahead and, and doing that you know there's a number of reasons why we don't do it you know uh, staff time, you know, the money, the commitment that would need to be done in order to mow all of that, in addition to, you know, that we are making these investments uh, for, through that type A seating. Because, you know, we want our roadsides to look diverse like this because it helps our roadsides be, you know, more integral and it helps keep those roadsides intact. Um, invasive, uh, so invasive species control, herbicide use, we have a great partnership uh, with NACO, so the the Weed County Board, so we try to engage with them at least yearly and talk about the importance of pollinators and best management practices when it comes to herbicide use. Uh, another really great part of our program is we've done a number of years of, of research, and so John's going to kind of elaborate about that. Just Thanks, Mercy. So when I the previous position I was in was at the University of Nebraska in the Range and Forage Research Group. And we partnered with NDOT at that point, NDOR, uh, doing a number of projects uh, looking at the success or the lack thereof of establishing plantings in parts of the state. So NDOT has been planting these, we'll say, diverse mixtures since the, the 1980s. Um, oftentimes early on, there was a lot of non-native species as well. Um, I know over the years, especially since like the early 2000s, most of those non-native species have have gone out of the seed mixes, so they're almost entirely native species. There's just a few that remain. Um, I think the important thing to note about these roadside plantings is they're harsh conditions because the best place to build, the best way to build a roadbed is to heavily compact it. So the soils are heavily compacted. Um, these sites get repeated mowing. There's a lot of additional wheel traffic from farm equipment traveling, people pulling off the side of the road. Um, there's just a lot of disturbance from snow removal activities and high salinity. I mean, you're talking about a lot of things that are really negative for plant growth and plant establishment. So it, it can be a pretty challenging area to work in. Um, so the past projects, uh, we had some soil amendment projects, um, adding topsoil or, or for different fertilization rates, looking at wildflower establishment and longevity, you know, and then probably the, the projects I'm going to focus on the most here today is an evaluation of the seed mixtures that NDOT used uh, in the past. So when this study was done, uh, the seedings were about 10 to 15 years old. And what we were looking at was how similar is the current community to what was seeded in the past. Now, um, one thing we're gonna say is there was a pretty, you know, we're talking about five years of different seedings. So you get a lot of, uh, you know, different climatic conditions. And then you're going across the state, you have a lot of different soils and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, every year we're planting projects in every part of the state. You know, we're spread out all over and that is a realistic perspective for us. So we, we kind of tried to get some sites that were all spread out. You know, sometimes the sites were we had, you know, a number to choose from, but some of them were just not very good or there had been obviously a lot of uh, additional disturbance beyond what was typically happens on a site. So they just weren't very good. So this is kind of a quick map of that. To discuss this, um, I think one thing that's really kind of interesting, so a richness number, if you look at this for total species, you know, we, our minimum was 39 uh, and as high as 
78. I didn't think most people would drive on a roadside and think that there's 40 species of plants out there. You know, um, you're typically seeing a lot of brome, a lot of bluegrass. I'm not going to deny that. You're seeing a lot of your big warm season grasses. They're really visual, especially at 65 miles an hour. But when you get down there, you're seeing a lot of other species of plants. Uh, both exotic and native species are showing up. I think probably another important point from this is you know, our seed mixture, you know, if we look at the number in parentheses here, that was the number of Forbes, for example, seeded. We seeded 18, we only had three show up. And that, that kind of plays out pretty commonly on all these sites where by 10 to 15 years, our seeded Forbes had basically disappeared. You know, there were some that were there, but they certainly weren't the dominant. Now our grasses, our grasses look a lot better. Most of the time, all, most or not all of them showed up you know, 10 to 15 years. So I think that's showing that these, these mixtures are, you know, stabilizing these sites from, from a, moving from construction site to a more vegetated community, but we're not seeing the long-term establishment of Forbes. And I think that that is something that we as an agency are challenged with doing moving forward. On an interesting note, I think one thing we didn't expect was the impact of surrounding land use driving our, the results on our project. So we took uh, basically everything that all this, the species that we had and we applied the floristic quality index number, FQI, which is a common technique used to evaluate uh, restorations and prairies. And you know, across the state, we've got you know, a, a lot of them, you know, we're having a lot of these higher numbers at zero, that means non-native. Your, your mid-range numbers are your typical common species of plants on, on a restoration or a prairie. And one thing we found was in the rangeland areas, so areas that were surrounded by native grassland, we had a higher proportion that were, you know, we, of species that were, that were native species, much more so than in the cropland areas. So what was happening was the native areas were acting as a seed source for the roadside. I don't think most of the time you think of, you know, invasive species coming off of the roadside and coming out into the surrounding landscape. I think that's important for our BUL considerations where as a, de a department we should consider, you know, when we work in an area that has a lot of intact grassland, our work can either influence or be influenced by. So I think this is kind of saying like maybe planting forbs on in the sand hills is probably not real worthwhile because they're going to come in anyway. And so that may be a way to help tailor our seed mixes to the kind of the conditions in the site and maybe you know we only have a certain amount of money and maybe we can pull that away and maybe emphasize work in northeast or southeast Nebraska because you know we're having a harder time establishing our, our native species in those areas. So again typically pretty grass dominated we're seeing a lot of you know without the lack of disturbance we're not really seeing much of a forb component they're really disappearing and I think if we want to have a long-term forb presence we're going to have to think about an herbicide burn down and interseeding on a periodic time frame to really enhance those those sites moving forward. Another project that I helped start and then as I left and came to this position it continued on. Um, this is a graduate student in entomology looking at um, these kind of these wildflower patches and how they influence bee communities. And so trying to assess native bees and compare like the diversity between these different patch sizes along roadside because um, obviously roads are linear, they're long stretches of projects where you have maybe have a fair amount of acres, but they're all skinny acres. They're, they're not square, big, contiguous acres. So patches are, could be something that could be very useful for us. And a patch would be something maybe 10 feet wide and 400 feet long. So it's essentially a, tr a drill pass worth to fill that landscape. So we had a pretty really diverse mixture. We tried to get things that were early bloomers, mid bloomers and late bloomers because, you know, obviously those, the landscape needs to support uh, the whole suite of, of insects during that time frame. So we tried to get a lot of different things that a lot of this stuff we don't normally plant because frankly it's really expensive, but we, that was what we wanted in this test mix. And so the, just kind of going through the bee community 2017. So that was the year that we planted in the spring. Um, we did have, you know, three different fam uh, families show up, but in 2018, as the, the, the plantings mature and we get better diversity uh, of flowers, we're seeing additional communities show up. So I think as these 
plantings age, we're, I mean, obviously it's, it's becoming better and better over time. I think most, kind of the most interesting thing that we saw was in bee richness. So the early and the late, our sites had more diversity in those areas. I think in the mid season, the rest of the landscape can do a little better job of supporting these communities. But I think road sites offer a really good place to have a sink for resources in the early and the late season. Because again, in these ag dominated landscapes, we're some of the only you know, diverse habitat that's offered. Um, so just kind of some quick discussion. So our, our wildflower patches were better than our conventional seeding method, uh, but within the patch, it wasn't different. So I think if we do a, a pulse kind of planting of patches, we can really enhance the quality of these sites. And we probably need to do a better job of adding more early and late season four species to our mixes so that we can enhance this bee habitat. And then um, probably again, looking at a longer term set of where we can go with this, um, again, with longer term data to see how we can be most attractive to bees. So. Uh, and again, some of the forbs didn't do as well as we've commonly found. And so I think that's something that we're, we're pursuing going forward. Three minutes, friends. Okay, great. Um, so John buzzed right through that. He said, I only get three puns, otherwise I owe him some refreshing beverages. So I'm gonna go through this pretty fast. Um, so another study that we did was taking a look at uh, on uh, on <laughs> uh, <laughs> at milkweed on the roadside. Uh, that was a study that I did in coordination with the Department of, of Transportation uh, with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, um, just to kind of assess like how how milkweed is doing without uh, across the landscape. And so I took a look at two roadside plantings, the Type A mix, and then just random uh, state and county roads. Uh, the data analysis was done by Dr. Chris Wonka, who does a great job. And we found that uh, our type A seedings uh, had much more milkweed per uh, hectare and that there was a significant difference between like having those seedings and then just the random roadsides that, that I was sampling. Um, uh, that study only took a look at, at milkweed and what we've seen with similar studies that have been published is that, you know, it's not just milkweed. You no, know, like we're also taking a look at the forb diversity uh, that needs to be in those areas so they can really truly be helpful for for monarchs and in a study uh, published in 2019 that also took a look at a number of different land use uh, found that um, uh, putting milkweed on roadsides is the most economically feasible strategy when it comes to creating monarch butterfly habitat um, so we're really excited that this year we're going to be kind of doing a continuation of the bee study that john talked about and again so um, we saw that some of those four species, you know, uh, weren't establishing. And so we're going to take a look at different uh, land management techniques that we can use to kind of uh, get those forbs to establish. And so we're going to be using some of our, our tools that we have in our Department of Transportation toolbox, such as, uh, such as mowing, to see what, what we can do in order to make sure that those areas are, are more diverse. And we're going to evaluate roadside use by, by monarchs. Um, so another thing that we do is public involvement. We are really involved with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and Fish and Wildlife um, when it comes to our Department of Transportation projects. Um, we look forward to engaging more with Pheasants Forever with, uh, and then through the research that we have with the UNL and then some citizen science projects that we could participate in with the Xerxes Society and the Monarch Joint Venture. So kind of just looking down the road, um, we're looking at our program in terms of habitat connectivity and biodiversity within the, those BULs on our roadside and continuing our, our partnerships uh, across the state. So we're looking to make Nebraska more of a, a drive through state. So not, it's not just for the birds and the bees, it's also for Nebraskans because I mean, who doesn't love wildflowers at 75 miles an hour? So any, any questions? 